dear learners, I am Trisha Dwara Borwa of the Bhupanasuta School of Mass Communication, Krishna Kanda Handy State Open University. I would like to welcome you all to another online video class on journalism and mass communication. In today's class, we are going to talk about the popular forms of traditional communications in the sun. This is the unit 9 of the paper Traditional Folk Media belonging to third semester being journalism and mass communication under Krishna Kanda Hand Institute of University. In this particular class, we are trying to we'll try to understand the different popular forms of traditional communication Assam, like Bihu, like Ainam, Lulebis, Ujapali, Hotria, Pauna, and Gogit. These are different eight different forms that we'll try to focus on more specifically. And after going through this unit, you'll be able to appreciate the role of folk media in preserving the cultural identity of Assam, as well as understand the development of the different folk forms in Assam. Now, when we talk about traditional folk forms in Assam, it's not only Assam, the traditional folk forms have been there for the past couple of years in the entire country. Assam too can boast of its very rich cultural heritage. It has its own distinctive, you know, folk forms, its distinctive religious discourses, its distinctive religious or, you know, folk songs, folk dance, and also as well, and uh, other narrative forms as well. Now, the first important or the most uh, popular folk song that comes to our mind when we talk about the different, uh, the most common, you know, uh, popular communication, uh, folk media communication tools is the Bihu songs. Now, Bihu is said to be the most important festival in Assam because it's related to the seasonal change, it's related to the cultivation as well as raising the livestock. Generally speaking, there are three types of Bihu. One is to celebrate it in the particular year and each coinciding with a distinctive phase in the farm calendar. We have the Rongali or the Bahag Bihu which is celebrated in the mid-April at the onset of spring. It actually marks the, you know, the beginning of the essence New Year and also the beginning of the agricultural season. And the uh, Bohak Bihu is actually celebrated with so much of fanfare, there's so much fun, there's so much of frolic, you know, people and it, it cut across the different generations, it cut across all the different age groups, you know, and celebrated by the young and the old, like, it's not only that, only a certain category of people like to enjoy the different festivities or different aspects associated with Bihu. The Kongali or the Kati Bihu that's actually observed the month of October. Okay, and there is not much merriment as far as Kati Bihu is concerned because the crops are always in a growing stage and the farmers actually pray for a very rich harvest okay, during this particular period. Then there is a Kogali or the Mag Bihu which is actually celebrated in mid January. And this marks the end of the harvesting season. So what actually people, since the end of the harvest season, season so people they gather together, uh, people try to have a you know, community feast and they try to enjoy the different festivities associated with this particular bihu. Now bihu has also many variations to it. Okay, it has many different types, many variations. We are very much aware of the term jang bihu. Now jang bihu is an ancient form of bihu dance form from a Assam and uh, this form of Bihu dance is mostly performed by the women folk and typically it is performed on a moonlit night in a, in a place where you know uh, they cannot be seen or accessed easily. So the word Jang Bihu is believed to have been inspired from the Assamese word Jang which means an obstructive barrier uh, indicating a barrier between the performance and the audience. Then we have the Mukoli Bihu. Now, Mukoli Bihu is from the term itself, you can make out it's actually performed in the open fields, open areas. And the young boys, they actually sing the Bihu song accompanied by the beating of the drums, there is a playing of the hornpipe, and the girls uh, join them in the field, they also dance together. Atmospheres that are very much merriment, very much fun, there is so much frolic in there. So, then we have the Moran Bihu. Now, Moran Bihu is also a typical form of Bihu dance, which is actually practiced by the Moran tribe of Assam. And it's actually in some place which is very far away from the hustle and bustle of the city life. The Moran boys they make a bamboo house, which is known as a Bihu Khan. It's divided into two sections. 
one is for the boys, other is for the girls. So they, so they even sing and dance throughout the entire night. And uh, most of the songs are woven around the themes of love and longing. Then we have the Missing Bihu. Now Missing Bihu is also a form which is associated with the Aliyah Ligang festival of the Missing Tribe. Okay, which is, this, this particular festival is a seed sowing festival. And uh, the dance is actually structured in such a way that it depicts the stages in the process of cultivation, uh, beginning from sowing to reaping. And the spirit that gets reflected in the missing bihu is that of spring, of fertility, of the kopo flower, of love, of longing and romance. Then we have the diori bihu. Now, this particular bihu is celebrated by the diories of Assam who are a tribe, a river and tribe who actually belong to the, the Lohit district of Uttar Pradesh. And the Diori view is very much different or distinctly different from other different forms of view. Okay, now when we talk about different view songs, now the songs are the expression of youthfulness, of freshness, of spirit, of love and courtship. And actually the expression of the carnival of life, they describe a season because that uh, most of the different types of view songs or different view performance are they coincidentally are related to different seasons of, of life and since it also describes the season in which the festival is held by referencing to the different flora and fauna on a particular season okay so that actually brings out a very you know a very authentic description of the social life of the environment and other religious belief of lessons then also we have the aina now, Ainam is a popular form of devotional song or song. Ainam is actually sung only by the women folks and the men folk are not part of the performance. I, I, the term I, I refers to Goddess Shitala, Hitala, the Divine Mother, who along with her seven sisters they considered as a goddess of box. Okay, so what happens is that it's very much common practice in Assamese households that uh, the people or the children who are affected by the box, they need to hold a prayer session in which the woman is saying Aina with a sense of submission and deep humility to propitiate the Divine Mother that uh, please leave the house and just go somewhere else. So it's just like a kind of divine intervention to actually you know, refer their own concerns to the Goddess Shitala and you know, ask her to leave the stricken household and proceed to somewhere else. And this Ainam, these songs are very much simple and yet they are very highly devotional in nature. Okay. Then we have the lulabis. Now when we talk about lulabis or the cradle songs, they are very commonly known as a Nisukuni Geet. Okay, the Nisukuni Geet are basi uh, you know, basically they are sung to lull the small babies or the small people who want to make them sleep in a proper way. And they are also known by different names like the Neem Dali Geet in Gwalpara district. Okay, then uh, there there is the uh, Soli Porpa Geet in Albari district. There are the Futu Mithai among the Burus. So, Lulabi is the main use of simple, crisp, and repetitive words that are borrowed from the daily lives of rural people. Okay, that have an essence of the land. And the, the sweetness of the songs, the sweet melody of the songs, it helps the children to develop the imaginative skills by carrying them to hold the imagination. Then we have the Ujapali. Now Ujapali is a you know, classical dance form. Basically it is considered to be one of the oldest art forms of some. And the uh, epics, we have the Hindu epics like Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Puranas, they are the main source for the story of Ujapali. Recitation, singing, dancing, gestures, other dramatic dialogues, they play a pivotal role in Ujapali performance. Now when we talk about Ujapali, uh, you know, basically consists of a band of four, of, there are actually four or five people are there, men folk are there. And the chief of which is called Uja and the rest of the associates are called Pali, meaning assistants. And among the Palis, the, the Daina Pali who stands on the right hand side of the Uja is the chief aide. He makes the performance more interesting by providing comic relief. And usually, you know, Ujapali has been categorized in two major forms. One is the epic place Ujapali and other is a non-epic place Ujapali. Let me talk about epic place Ujapali. Now, it's basically known as a Vaishnava Ujapali. And it's usually used in a Vaishnava rituals. 
and the themes are drawn from the epics of Ramayana or Mahabharata or Puranas. Then we have the non epic based on Japani. In this particular form, uh, this is associated with the worshipping of the serpent goddess, goddess Manasha, that is Manoha, also referred to as uh, Vishali, Padma or Brahman. And as such, the content, the structure, and the context varies from the epic based Ujjabal. Of course, among the epic based and non epic based Ujjabal, there are also other different forms which you will be able to get a better overview after you going go through your respective SLS. Then we have the Hotria or the Satria. The, the Hotria dance form is introduced in the 15th century AD by the great Vaishnava saint Mahapurukha Hongkodi. He has a very powerful medium for propagation of the Vaishnava faith. And the Hotria dance form it actually evolved and expanded as a distinctive style of dance later on. The new Vaishnava treasure of Assamis dance and drama has been for centuries nurtured and preserved with great commitment by the Hotros, that is Vaishnava Mahats or Monasteries. Shimonta Hongkodev actually introduced this dance form by incorporating the different elements from various traditions, from local folk dances with his own rare outlook. So there are actually two dance forms prevalent in Assam before even the new Vaishnava movement was the Ujjapali and the Nevatas, with many other pretty classical elements as well. And uh, Hotria dance tradition is actually governed by strictly laid down principles uh, as far as the music is concerned, as far as the dance movement is concerned, as far as the footwork is concerned, you know, there are very strict principles are being laid for that. And this particular tradition has two distinctly, you know, separate streams. One is the Bhavna related repertoire, starting from the Gayan, Bhayana, Nach to the karma or not the secondly the dance numbers which are independent such as a chali or ragharia chali so, and different and so and so forth then we have the bhavna now bhavna is a presentation of the onkya nat which is a one act play of a song it has been introduced by hongkar deva himself to actually preach vaishnava religion to the masses and before it was introduced before its introduction by hongkar deva there was no such evidence of theatre in Assam. Of course, uh, there were certain other dramatic elements were present uh, in the form of Ujjapali and Kutalanas, but apart from that, there were no such, you know, you know other evidence of theatre in Assam. So, Bhavana actually, you know, was something that actually represented the, you know, Vaishnavite religion at the wider scale. And in the simplest form, Bhavana actually depicts the victory of over evil, generally drawing its themes from the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Purana. And uh, usually in a Bhavana troupe, there is there are the singers are there, there are the instrumentalists are there, Bayan, Gayan, Bayan actors, Putradhar is also there, that's a narrator who narrates the story. So the performers they enter to an archway of light which is known as the Ognigar. And Hutradhar actually starts the play by narrating the story accompanied by the Gayan Bhaya. It has been traditionally performed in the precinct of the Namgars. Namgars are basically, you know, they are congregational hall, camp, cultural spaces, and usually in open spaces. So in Bhavana, the cultural glimpses of Assam, Bengal, Orissa, Mathura, Brindavan, etc. can be seen. Then we have the Borgit, is another important media forms of a song. Borgit are, they are known as noble numbers or celestial songs. They are basically Vaishnava uh, devotion songs, uh, the first composed by Hong Kong. And they are yet another noble contribution of the great Vaishnava saint to the cultural landscape of a song. And Hong Kong's first Borgit composition is, you know, is believed to be something which actually penned uh, somewhere between 19 and from this first, you know, the Borgit composition, he later went to compose around 240 Borgits, of which only around around 30 of them exist today. The rest of them actually were lost in a fire after which he actually stopped writing further. And uh, this Borgits actually you know, represent the the very much the cultural ethnicity of the of Assam. The, the way the, it, it focuses on the 
the cultural dimension of the state of Assam. It, it gives uh, a brief overview of how the state has evolved, how the different, you know, uh, traditional folk forms are interwoven together. So those areas are being portrayed through such kind of folk songs. Now we have the Lukogit. Now Assamese Lukogit can actually be classified into three types. We have the ceremonial songs like the new songs, Ainam, Dianam, Menam. We have the ballads like Munipwara Git, Warfupanar Git. Okay, they are the ballads. Then we, are, we have also other miscellaneous theme songs like Milula Des. Okay, and so on and so forth. So, Luka Git covers a wide range of themes like devotional, social, philosophical, youth related, something related to courtship, something related to longings and love. So and so forth. And they are the manifestation of the collective hope, desire, needs, and activities of the people at large. So, with this, we come to the end of our today's class. In this in today's session, we have tried to analyze the popular forms of tradition communication in Assam. Now, more specifically, we have tried to understand Bihu, Ainam, there were Lula Bees, Ujapali, Hotria, Bhavana. Borgit as well as Lukagit. Apart from this, there are also other traditional folk forms, but we are trying to just concentrate only on a few important ones. And uh, I'm sure after going to this particular unit, you will be actually able to understand how these different folk forms have been you know, preserving the cultural identity of the state of Assam. How these different folk forms have been working around, you know, over the past few decades to, you know, uh, unite the people and bring about a development in the society of the state of Assam. And after, of course, after going through this unit, you will be able to appreciate and understand the popular traditional folk forms and how these different folk forms have had a massive impact on the people of Assam in bringing about the rural development in this particular region. So, with this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. And, uh, you know, if you would like to understand the different traditional folk forms of Assam in a much better way. We have enlisted a number of other uh, important books in your respective uh, study material. There are other books by, you know, Bandha Padhya, uh, which is about the Northeast Saga. We have a very important book by S. N. Bokotuni, which is about the tribal folk tales of Assam. Then another very important book is the Homer Homskriti, that is that has been brought up by Dr. Nobin Sondranath. So you can get hold of these books or uh, if you would like, uh, you can just, you know, search for such kind of resources in your online resources for your own benefit. So with this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Thank you so much.